Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Gut Instincts Microbiome Arthritis Connection webinar. I am so excited to be here, and my name is Miriam Uslam. I'm a business operations professional and founder of the Arthritic Life blog, where I share my journey with rheumatoid arthritis, as well as a passionate advocate for arthritis and mental health. I'm sorry, this is my first time doing this, so be patient with me. <laughs> Um, I've been advocating with the Arthritis Foundation for a little over a year, and I'm so, so grateful to have this channel to express myself as a RA warrior and advocate for myself and others suffering from this debilitating disease. I have been living with rheumatoid arthritis for over 12 years and have become well aware of the benefits of controlling inflammation in my body. Being born and raised in a family with huge foodies and no limitations on what and when to eat, I struggled, but slowly recognized the importance of following an anti-inflammatory diet and how it affects my arthritis. Over time, I have become health conscious and am always interested in looking for complementary ways to help control my inflammation. Knowing well enough that medications play a huge role in, my, in controlling my arthritis, as well as physical activity, staying hydrated, resting, and addressing my mental health when I need it. That's why I'm so excited about this topic tonight, where we're going to, where we're going to talk about um, gut health and how it can play in helping dial down inflammation and manage arthritis symptoms. Um, next, we're going to go over to our VIM video. When you download the free VIM app from the Arthritis Foundation, you'll be able to set achievable goals. You hit your goal. I knew you could do it. And find a wealth of information to help you manage your chronic pain. This recipe is a big help with joint inflammation. about a cup to a cup and a half. While also becoming a member of a community that offers advice, encouragement, and support 24 hours a day. Janice, you're doing so much better. Thanks for saying that. Ready to go to lunch? Wouldn't miss it. Download the free VIM app from the Arthritis Foundation and start taking back what chronic pain has taken away. Just a quick note, all of our attendees have been muted. Our Q&A is gonna be after the presentation and um, we'll reserve time for any questions that you have at the end. Um, you'll also receive an email about your experience and those surveys help us better plan for future events. So please take the time to fill them out. That would mean a lot to us. And we are gonna now get started with Dr. Renuka Nayak. Dr. Ranuka Nayak is an assistant professor in the Department of Rheumatology at the University of California. As a physician scientist, she is dedicated to advancing the care and the treatment of patients with rheumatologic conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, psoriatic arthritis, and other autoimmune diseases. She uses her unique backgrounds in biology, computer science, and clinical rheumatology to investigate the role of the human gut microbiome in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. We also have Dr. Monica Guma. Dr. Monica is a rheumatologist who treats a variety of musculoskeletal diseases and autoimmune conditions, including rheumatoid arthritis and spondyloarthritis. That's a hard one. <laughs> she is also a biomedical scientist with interest in finding new biomarkers and therapeutic targets for inflama inflammatory arthritis. At her self-named Guma Lab, her research focuses on the role of diet on the microbiome as an intervention for arthritis. 
Doctors Nayak and Guma, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm very excited to hear from both of you. And now I'll hand it over to Dr. Nayak, please. Thanks so much for inviting me to uh, this webinar. So I wanted to, in the 25 minutes that I have for this presentation, define the microbiome, briefly go over methods of studying the microbiome, define probiotics and their uses, and then also spend a little bit of time talking to you about fecal microbiota transplants. Um, and then I'll give it over to Dr. Guma to talk about microbiome, diet, metabolism. So um, many of you may know, but there may be some people who are unfamiliar with uh, what we mean when we talk about the microbiome. And the microbiome consists of the microorganisms such as bacteria, viruses, archaea, and fungi, as well as the genes that they bring with them, so their genomes as well. And so when we're talking about the microbiome, we're talking about not just the microbes, but also the genes that they bring with them. And what we've learned, microbiome researchers like myself have learned, is that there are all different kinds of microbiomes. Um, there's the human gut microbiome, the skin microbiome, but beyond the human microbiome, there's also an ocean microbiome and a soil microbiome. And what we've come to appreciate is that these microorganisms play important roles in the environments in which they reside. You and others may be wondering, why is the microbiome important? And for this, I like to ask a related question of what happens when you get rid of the microbiome. And here I'm showing you a, um, a notobiotic isolator in which we're able to grow up germ-free animals like this mouse that doesn't have any microbiota. And what we know from these germ-free animals is that compared to their colonized counterparts, you know, other animals that have microbiome, germ-free animals are nutritionally underdeveloped. And that's because we need our microbiome to extract energy and nutrients from the foods that we eat. These germ-free animals have a stunted immune system and they're susceptible to more infection. <clears throat> and I guess surprisingly and unexpectedly is that they also have neurologic deficits. They have anxiety, hyperactivity, and learning and memory deficits. And so because of these and other important functions that the microbiome provides to the host, Researchers like myself consider the microbiome as extending the capabilities of the host genome and that they're a second genome to our own genome. And if we understand more about them and their genes that they're bringing with them, then we could develop therapies targeting the microbiome and microbial genes. So the microbiome research field has really been revolutionized by new technologies. Before all of these new technologies, the way we learned about microbes was to be able to grow them up on a Petri dish and study them in, in the lab on the bench or take them and transplant them into mice and study what the effect of those microbes were on the mice. But, um, and so all of this depended on our ability to culture microbes. And we were not very good at that actually. So there were a lot of microbes that we couldn't culture. So we, we didn't know about them. But then with the development of culture independent techniques, we were able to use advances in sequencing and chemistry to ask now questions like who is present in a microbiome? What are the microbes that are present? What are they capable of doing? What are they actually doing? What proteins are they producing? And what are they doing metabolically? What metabolites are they producing in the gut that may then translocate into other organs um, like the liver and the pancreas and the brain. So um, these technologies have really allowed us to ask a whole host of new questions and learn about the microbiome. And surely you guys have heard that the number of microbes that live in and on us either is the same as our own cells, same number of microbial cells as our own cells, or maybe a little bit more. And each person harbors about 100 to 150 species in their gut. Um, but then when you look across everybody, there are um, over 10 to a trillion, um, or, sorry, 10,000 species that exist across people. So what that tells you is that each person's microbiome is very personalized. And you know, the amount of overlap between your microbiome and my microbiome may not be very much. Um, the, so there's like a lot of diversity in the microbes that are present in our gut and in our skin and other parts of our body but also they bring with them a large genetic repertoire. There's a bunch of genes that they bring with them. And for each one of our own genes, we have 150 microbial genes. So 
there's 150 fold more microbial genes in our body than our own, our own genes. So, and these genes are the ones that we rely on to do the things like you know, educate our immune system, digest um, our food. And um, you know, there's a little warning sign here to remind me to tell you that there's a tendency to kind of characterize microbes as good guys and bad guys, but it really depends on context. And that good microbes in the gut can become pathogenic if they're somewhere other than the gut, for example, in the blood. So it's kind of important to learn about each microbe and understand what their role is in different contexts. And then this figure shows microbes exist um, in a lot of different environments, in the airway, in the mouth, on the skin, in the GI tract, and even in the urogenital system. So um, the gut microbiome is <clears throat> highly personalized. I kind of alluded to this before. And so one sort of a, a demonstration of that is I'm showing you here um, a study that we conducted in my lab where we looked at people before or after a drug intervention. In this case, we were giving them methotrexate. And so um, this is kind of a map of each person's microbiome and where they are on that map. And what you can see is that even after giving everyone methotrexate, they all kind of change their microbiome in different ways. And so it's not like all of them kind of come to a central location on this map. They kind of all shift you know, their microbiomes in, in very unique and personalized ways. Um, and that's because they're, each person's microbiome, in addition to being very personalized and individual, is shaped by a number of different factors, including um, where they grew up, the, the age that they're at, their life cycle stage, stress that they may experience, the diet that they're taking, the other drugs um, that they may be ingesting. And so because of this, per, this very personalized and individualized nature of the microbiome, the way that the microbiome responds to things is also personalized. So here's a really good example that I think um, Dr. Guma will discuss further, but you know, these investigators saw that if you give people kind of a standardized in, um, diet or intervention, like food intervention, they actually have very different responses. So here's two people on the top and the bottom. These investigators are looking at glucose levels in response to either eating a banana or cookies. And I would have thought that if you know you have a cookie, then your glucose will rise, like in this participant, but maybe a banana, which is not as sugary, will not cause as much of, a, of an increase. And so that's what we see with this participant down here. But you can see this participant 445 actually has the reverse, that the banana causes a bigger spike in sugar levels in the blood um, than the cookies do. And that's surprising. And uh, these investigators suggest that the microbiome may be responsible for this very personalized response to the same dietary intervention. And that same principle also exists with drugs. You know, we have for many um, decades noticed that um, different people respond differently to the same kind of drug. Some people have a good response or intermediate response, or like no response at all. And investigators have looked at factors like the genome or environmental factors like diet and smoking, but the microbiome in recent years we found plays a role as well. And this is not as true, not just in rheumatology, but in diverse fields such as cancer and in HIV therapies as well. So with that kind of very brief introduction, I um, wanted to very briefly go over ways that we could actually modify the microbiome. And this is a kind of a frontier in microbiome research. There's still so much that we don't know. Um, but there are ways that people are looking at um, to improve gut health in patients. And probably the ones that you guys have most likely heard about are um, probiotics and fecal microbiota transplant or FMT, which I'm gonna spend the next few slides talking about. Um, but also you guys have heard about antibiotics is a very good way to alter our gut microbiome, um, but sometimes like not the desirable way to alter our microbiome. And then now there are, um, companies developing drugs to tar target microbial genes or use viruses that target bacteria um, and also using new technologies called CRISPR-Cas9. I won't have time to kind of go over that. So um, probiotics are widely available. You can buy them here on Amazon, Whole Foods, CVS, whatever. Um, you know, you could buy things, you could probably find probiotics. And the definition of a probiotic is a um, basically a cocktail or a solution of a living organism that's deemed to be beneficial for health. 
And I think the key thing that I want you guys to know is that probiotics are not drugs. And um, you know they've existed for a really long time, for um, at least a century. And you know probably you can counter probiotics in food, like in yogurt and kefir and kimchi. Um, and because of that, it's not they're not considered drugs. And so the industry is largely unregulated by the FDA. And so because of that, companies can kind of market the products directly to consumers and make claims about health that are not backed up by rigorous or randomized con um, controlled clinical trials. And so because of that, um, this direct to consumer marketing, um, my, the probiotics are, have widespread use, but not a lot of evidence to demonstrate their effectiveness in a clinical setting. Um, and additionally, because they're not regulated, the preparation of probiotics is not standardized. And sometimes, you know, investigators have found that if you take all these probiotics off the shelf and you actually test whether what they say on the label is in the, the bottle or in the yogurt, a lot of times that thing is not there. So about 30% of, you know, the, the, um, the products that are out there actually don't contain that organism in living form. Um, and, or, or the strains are not actually what the, the companies are saying is present. Despite this, there's actually growing use of probiotics among Americans. About uh, 3.9 million Americans were using probiotics in 2015, and that's a fourfold increase from uh, 2007. So just a little bit more terminology. So probiotics is probably what you most heard about. They're live organisms, and um, there is some suggestion that in immunocompromised hosts, like a lot of my patients, they could actually cause an infection in the blood called septicemia. Um, so we're a little bit cautious about probiotics. Prebiotics are indigestible foods or starches that we cannot digest, but that these live bacteria can, and that promote uh, prebiotics are foods that kind of promote the presence of good bacteria. And so for them to work effectively clinically, obviously you have to have good bacteria already present in the gut. And so one way to sort of ensure that that's the case is to um, develop symbiotics, which are pills or foods that have both prebiotics, which is the food for the probiotics, the beneficial microbes. So those are called symbiotics. You know, and I think like a um, sort of key issue with probiotics that people bring up is that, you know, you ingest them, it goes into the, the stomach, which is very acidic and will kill a lot of bacteria. Um, and so, you know, probiotics may actually not ever get to like the rest of the gut. And so um, what people have been looking at are postbiotics, whether there are metabolites that are produced by probiotics that can confer the good effects of these bacteria on the human. <clears throat> and postbiotics, you don't need to worry about colonization or the presence of good bacteria or even infections because these are not live organisms. They're actually the products that these probiotics are making that are beneficial. So um, I put a little message here that if any biotic, like a prebiotic, probiotic, or postbiotic makes a claim to prevent or treat or alleviate disease, that's when FDA approval is needed. That's when um, we need clinical trials and things like this. But if you take a look at probiotics, they don't actually make claims of alleviating disease. Usually they say something like it'll improve health. And that's a different kind of claim than saying it's going to alleviate disease. <coughs> so, um, so I wanted to, you know, you may have seen in, in, the, in the literature on websites about the use of probiotics for a lot of different conditions. But um, there are investigators that look at where, where do we have good evidence for using probiotics. Um, and this is a kind of guideline from the American Gastroenterological Association where they looked at the data and found that actually there's only moderate, like not strong evidence, but moderate evidence to support the use of probiotics really in only three conditions. One is in preterm infants, neonates that are, are at risk for a very severe gastrointestinal disease called necrotizing enterocolitis. So there's good evidence to use probiotics in that situation in order to promote gut health. Another um, condition is in people who are taking antibiotics, both children and adults, 
that are at risk for developing a very severe gastrointestinal infection cause uh, clostridia difficile infection. So that's another um, situation where probiotic may be useful. And then the third is in patients that have a autoimmune disease called ulcerative colitis, where the immune system attacks the gut. And um, in patients that have a specific kind of surgical uh, intervention called a pouch, a surgical pouch, they could develop infection of that. It's called pouchitis. And probiotic may or may not be helpful um, in that condition. But other than those three conditions, there's really not good evidence for other diseases like rheumatoid arthritis or osteoarthritis, um, or at least this group of experts didn't find that the, the strength was really strong. And so, you know, when I, for this webinar, looked in the literature, um, and, you know, for my own research as well, I looked in the literature for, uh, you know, the demonstration of efficacy of probiotics in rheumatoid arthritis and other autoimmune, systemic autoimmune diseases, you know, I found that a lot of the studies that are kind of summarized here that were done in patients, randomized control trials usually looked at small numbers of patients between 20 to 60 patients, um, <clears throat> a lot of them are using lactobacillus, which is a common probiotic strain. Other common probiotic strains are bifidobacterium and streptococcus. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of these studies are small. So it's not clear to me whether this is generalizable to diverse patient populations. And the, the results are mixed. You know, some people didn't find any evidence of efficacy, whereas, um, you know, they when I'm looking at these studies, I'm really interested in knowing that from the patient perspective, you know, is the tender joint count reduced? Are there less tender joints or are there less swollen joints? And a lot of times there aren't, um, you know, significant effects on tender joint count or swollen joint count, although there are some instances of that. So a lot of times it's looking at uh, effects on other parameters like levels of inflammatory markers in the blood. <clears throat> but, you know, for the things that patient, my patients care about, like the tender joint count or pain, um, the, the evidence is kind of mixed. But um, as I said, this is a frontier of uh, research and there are um, you know, investigators looking at the next generation of probiotics where we're not just looking at you know, these common strains, but looking at strains, new strains <clears throat> that are developed in you know, standardized way using good manufacturing processes and practices. Um, they're studying these genetically modified microbes in randomized controlled trials. They're getting FDA approval and looking at specific disease categories. There's a lot of money being pumped into this, both um, by the government and also by private, private industry and private equity. So that's all probiotics. Um, I'm gonna spend the next few slides talking a little bit about FMT um, in the last few minutes that I have. And FMT, fecal microbiota transplant, <coughs> sorry, is the um, de delivery of not like one or two strains, but rather a community of microbes. And uh, typically we get this community of microbes from other people, fecal samples, and they can be delivered either as pills or in liquid format through colonoscopy um, in order to kind of establish, reestablish the balance of nature in the gut. And FMT has been around for a really long time, since the fourth century AD, it was first used by Ge Hong in uh, China, <clears throat> and then kind of had renewed interest in the 1950s for the treatment of C. diff. And that's really where we have key evidence for the use of FMT is to treat Clostridium difficile infection. Again, this is a disease that we see in patients that are given frequent antibiotics and it can kill people. Um, and so um, this is a landmark study that was done in 2013 showing that people who got fecal microbiota transplant were cured without relapse at a higher percentage than people who received antibiotics for this infection. And so with that, discovery, people had a really a lot of excitement for using FMT for other diseases. And, but the evidence for use in these diverse other diseases like gastrointestinal disorders or metabolic disorders or even neurologic disorders, evidence for that is, um, is not there yet. But um, this is also an active area of investigation. And you can see FMT is being used in a lot of different trials um, and in, in a number of immunologic disorders 
including rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's disease, psoriatic arthritis, ankylosis spondylitis, among others. But you know, delivering this community of microorganisms is not without its risks. Um, and a lot of patients who get FMT have gastrointestinal symptoms and also sometimes low grade fever. There are serious adverse events, but they're rare. And um, there was a, a case of uh, death from FMT um, in an immunocompromised uh, patient that received um, FMT because they also got kind of an infectious organism in that community. So now FMTs are very highly regulated and people's microbial communities are screened before they're transplanted into patients. So um, that's a little bit about FMT. And so you may be wondering what are indicators of gut health? And we don't actually have great tests to look at gut health, um, but oftentimes patient signs and symptoms are really good indicators such as nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, soft stools, bloating, excessive gas, reflux, and just general malaise. And other than tests that we have to check for infections, there's no standardized test to evaluate gut health. And to me, what that suggests is that um, our microbiomes are very personalized and there's still a lot that we're learning about the microbiome. And so um, in rheumatology, my advice to my patients is like, you should listen to your body, pay attention to how foods are making you feel and how they make your gut feel and how they make your symptoms, your arthritis symptoms feel. Um, and until we learn more about that, you know, there's not much that I actually prescribe for my patients in the way of probiotics or FMT or even diet because I don't know what to tell them other than make sure you're eating a healthy diet that's low in processed foods. So there's a lot to learn about the microbiome. We really need patients like you to enroll in studies so we can learn about the microbiome and actually modify it in rational ways. Um, the key take home for you guys is probiotics are not regulated, but they are widely available. And sometimes what's on the bottle is not what's in the bottle. So it's important to check that. If you are interested in trying antibiotics, talk about, I mean, sorry, probiotics, talk about it with your um, provider. I do sometimes prescribe probiotics for my patients, especially with gastrointestinal manifestations, but that's like not generally, that's kind of on a case by case basis. Um, and I kind of tell the patient, like I don't have a, a great evidence to support the use of this, but it's something we can try. Um, fecal microbiota transplant, the jury's still out for this in terms of arthritis and joint diseases. And again, like really just listen to your body and how it's responding to um, interventions that modify the microbiome. And with that, I'm happy to turn it over to Dr. Guzma. I want to start about uh, the motivation of this study. I'll, I'll explain to you uh, the motivation why I decided to do some research uh, on diet in RA. And it was because uh, in our uh, practice, uh, our patients, especially RA patients, they really like uh, frequently uh, seek these other like uh, sources of relief and try to get some treatments without uh, side effects. And they all ask about uh, diet interventions. They all ask about if uh, they should change diet, um, if I can maybe like a change diet and then take less pills, uh, maybe stop medication. So um, these questions are practically uh, every day in our uh, clinical practice. And I realized that we didn't have, uh, we didn't have like a good answers uh, for my patients because even, even there is some data that I'll kind of like a review in my presentation, there is, uh, there is no clearly a dietary um, intervention uh, well established as a complementary treatment. I want to emphasize here that uh, all my research is complementary treatment. I don't change the standard of care treatment. I don't decrease or stop medication. I simply uh, keep the patient with the standard of care treatment that we have some um, evidence uh, in our uh, studies in RA and I add the diet on top of that. So um, the other motivation of the study it was because we really want to understand the biology of these, uh, of these uh, improvements. So um, Dr. Nayak explained very well about the microbiome is playing an important role in uh, all, the, all the outcomes and, 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 and diseases. It's really like a, it doesn't mean that all can be explained by the microbiome, but it's really helping to explain a lot of like a, a diseases and, and behaviors of the diseases. And one of the reasons is because once you like a change your diet and you start like a including all these ingredients, 
and uh, in the different digests that we that we uh, propose, and you have um, the the microbiome. This microbiome is going to be different in all our patients. Uh, we still uh, there is a lot of unknowns about uh, what is uh, it could be the good microbiome or bad microbiome, but for sure there is like a different microbiome in all of us. So when we uh, take all these ingredients and the microbiome will metabolize these ingredients, we'll have a lot of like a mediators it's called uh, metabolites. They are, they are mediators, some of them, they're going to be pro-inflammatory, some of, of, of them are going to be anti-inflammatory, that when um, they uh, affect the intestinal barrier, but they also are absorbed in the uh, systemic circulation and through the, um, the veins and the arteries will reach the uh, synovial tissue, will reach the joints. So the, the thing about the diet, uh, and that is the research that we uh, are trying to, 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 to understand, is the, um, uh, how... Uh, changing the diet and, and maybe, maybe uh, uh, modulating this microbiome, this pool of pro and anti-inflammatory metabolites will change a little bit. And when they go to the systemic uh, circulation and reach the joints, that's, that's why you are going to uh, feel uh, more or less swelling and more or less um, pain. So the first thing that we did, and uh, this is already published and is open. So um, uh, this is the the... The name of the of the journal, but we can for sure send you uh, a copy of this uh, manuscript that is uh, is open in the literature. Is uh, that we established this uh, diet is an anti-inflammatory diet. Um, it was because even though there is some data, nice data about uh, Mediterranean diet to be a good intervention. So this is already known, and following Mediterranean diet uh, should work for RA, uh, or maybe like a, this nice uh, paper about vegetarian diet and also very well uh, uh, done trial uh, showing that these uh, diet changes are good for RA. We had the feeling that uh, not a lot of people want to move to this vegetarian uh, uh, diet. Uh, some people, they simply uh, don't want to do that or they don't feel uh, uh, able to do that. At the same time, we thought that uh, we could improve this Mediterranean diet. We could uh, add some other ingredients. They are like a more like anti-inflammatory nutrients uh, on top of the uh, med diet to improve uh, maybe the outcomes uh, in RA. So um, the first uh, work, uh, again, summarized in this paper, was to discuss with our patients, uh, trying to find uh, what was the best uh, diet strategies and ingredient selections from the literature, but then from the patients discuss um, what are the ingredients that they had more accessibility. It was like a feasible to introduce in the diet, kind of like a questions about uh, schedules, about structure of the diet, and then with that, we um, uh, introduce, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll go back. We introduce all these ingredients in this, um, in this diet that we will uh, call uh, ITIS diet. I simply want to also emphasize, we, we reviewed this in uh, this, uh, this uh, review last year, that uh, there are trials uh, using uh, different uh, components. Uh, people ask all the time about curcumin, uh, uh, ginger, ginger uh, mango. There is a lot of trials, uh, good trials, uh, randomized trials with placebo, with uh, some uh, medications as a control, uh, mostly in OA, but also in RA. And those, uh, th those uh, trials, they showed um, an improvement. They, they showed like an, uh, an effect of these uh, components. Uh, as we'll discuss uh, later, it's not for all the patients. Some of these uh, responses are not uh, uh, homogeneous. We'll go... Uh, uh, back uh, about that later. But what I mean is that some of these data are really in the literature. There is like a clearly data uh, proposing that some ingredients are actually anti-inflammatory. And it's not only in uh, clinical um, uh, data, also some uh, biological markers that we, we check always to, to show some uh, bi uh, biologic effect in our like, body for uh, especially inflammation. So I simply like again uh, another like a, a example of uh, different randomized clinical trials, good trials. Some of them good numbers of patients, 120 patients, uh, 200 patients. So not uh, super small. Uh, they follow the patients a few months, and with these some of these components, uh, cinnamon, green, green tea, uh, blueberries. I mean there is a few of them, and where they see an, an improvement of clinical outcomes and also changes in our inflammatory market. So we put all this uh, together in uh, what we call um, like a, our recommendations. Most of these recommendations, we really try to find 
uh, from the literature some evidence. Uh, it's true that some evidence we found not only in patients, but mostly in uh, maybe animal models, uh, uh, but still we try to uh, put together recommendations um, that they, we had some evidence from the literature. And basically the big uh, changes were like uh, increase the omega-3 intake, uh, really uh, increase these uh, ingredients with uh, this kind of, um, of uh, uh, anti-inflammatory uh, fat, uh, increase the, the vegetables and fruits as expected, induce the consume as uh, Dr. Nayak uh, said of uh, prebiotics and probiotics, but we didn't give any pill. We were trying to do everything with a diet. So uh, mostly changing the, the diet and, in, and including a lot of like a juices for like a more fiber, uh, vegetables, more fibers, and then uh, with the yogurt uh, and miso to uh, give some uh, probiotics. Uh, these enzymatic fruits also very good uh, in the literature for anti-inflammatory properties, um, give a lot of like a turmeric and, and black pepper as a, as a condiment. And then uh, we um, decrease the consumption of some um, uh, vegetables that is known to uh, be uh, more pro-inflammatory. Uh, we don't know exactly why, but eggplants, tomatoes, potatoes, uh, they, seem be, uh, they seem to be uh, pro-inflammatory. Um, decrease the red meat and decrease the gluten, uh, decrease the dairy products, and then uh, introduce some seeds that they have a lot of like uh, uh, anti-inflammatory properties. So with all these uh, recommendations, and again, these um, open in this, uh, can be like a, a red in our uh, publication. We had this um, ITIS diet. Uh, we uh, try to uh, give like a, some flexibility to the, our patients not to be very strict. So uh, we hope that this diet can be, um, is, is feasible and can be well um, followed by our patients. So um, the smoothies is a good, a good way to include a lot of vegetables, a lot of fruits, a lot of fiber, seeds, so it's like a combination where you can uh, include a lot of these anti-inflammatory um, ingredients. And then with the breakfast, uh, always like a yogurt, always green tea for uh, his like, uh, their uh, anti-inflammatory properties, uh, some flexibility in the lunch and, and dinner. So you can mix uh, salad, some grains and some legumes. Um, but again, uh, uh, try to give some uh, flexibility and then as a snack, uh, uh, also, um, some walnuts because they give a lot of like a omega-3 uh, fruits and uh, in, the uh, in the dinner, um, uh, a lot of like a more protein, uh, but not red meat uh, with salads and, and miso soup. So with this uh, ITIS diet, we uh, um, uh, started a pilot uh, trial. Uh, this is a short trial. We are now doing a longer trial, but that was like a more like a proof of concept and see if the patient liked the diet, and it was feasible for them. So we recruit RA patients that they had some inflammation, not a lot of inflammation, but some inflammation that they, they were really like willing to, to change the, the diet. It was not very long. It was total three or four weeks, but the idea was to try to, again, to um, get preliminary data of like a feasibility and, 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 and outcomes. And, um, and the first thing that we observed is that uh, adherence was really very, uh, very high. I think that giving uh, that flexibility and, uh, and some, of course, um, uh, mandatory ingredients uh, helped. So this is like a, a score that we um, uh, kind of like invented to be able to uh, study the adherence to this diet. So you can see that at the beginning of the, of the diet, um, most of the people, these negative uh, scores means that patient was eating what we call pro-inflammatory um, ingredients. Maybe they were like uh, drinking too many uh, sodas or eating a lot of pastries or a lot of red meat or a lot of milk. And then how at the end of the diet, they uh, were able to, uh, to stop or decrease uh, most of, uh, of these uh, ingredients and how the anti-inflammatory scores, everybody eats a little bit of like a um, omega-3 with fish, uh, uh, some seeds, but we were able to increase uh, a lot, even almost getting to the gold standard of 200, uh, the amount of anti-inflammatory um, ingredients that they uh, were uh, eating. And they uh, also, as uh, we were very pleased to see that the clinical outcomes, they improved um, uh, a lot. So uh, several, several outcomes, pain, uh, tender joints, uh, these are these uh, components that we calculate in our uh, practice that is basically a combination of pain, tender joints, swollen joints, 
and you can see how um, all of them decreased very clear in only uh, between two and four weeks of diet. This is the average. These are uh, 20, 25 patients that they, they finish the, the diet and the average, as you can see, very, very nice, very significant. But when we uh, uh, studied in, in more detail, we observed that not all the patients responded at the same extent. I think this is a very important uh, message because I also don't want to give the uh, impression that if we all change diet, we will all uh, um, get the same outcome. Is That's the problem with the diets, the problem with our um, uh, drugs. Uh, they're all very good, but the, that, that response is not homogeneous. We observe that more or less half of them, they improved a lot. It was really very, very clear, very obvious. But uh, half of the patients, they were not really very like uh, exciting. I mean, they observed some improvement, but it was not significant. It was nothing really like a, a major. Overall, they were happy changing the habits, but when we went like uh, really to check the outcomes, they were not um, uh, really uh, responders. So we started to uh, analyze, okay, why some patients they did respond and why some patients they simply, they didn't respond when that adherence was very homogeneous. Practically all the patients, they reached the same uh, um, uh, adherence of the diet. It was not because some patients, they simply didn't eat what they were supposed to eat. They was like a something, something else. So one of the things that we observed actually was that the most important thing was uh, the diet at the beginning. So if you check here, the anti-inflammatory score, that was actually quite interesting. The patients that they respond, that is are the blue patients, they actually had the baseline, their own diet, it was a little bit more like a, like a, we would say like a more, like a healthier or better. They were like a, by a definition, eating more, anti-inflammatory ingredients. They were still eating junk food, sodas, red meat, bad things. So uh, the, the pro-inflammatory score was very similar as you can see here, but the anti-inflammatory score, it was uh, better. So that means that the patients, even if they were having inflammation and they were eating some of like a, the forbidden food, the baseline, their, their diet, they had uh, already some uh, components that help them to, um, to uh, respond to our diet. So, because as Dr. Nayak said very well, the diet and the microbiome goes uh, quite together, then we move to try to understand what happened with the uh, microbiome. So with the microbiome, uh, that's a, a way to uh, measure the microbiome. We sequence the, the microbiome. We also like a check then the metabolites or what we call inflammatory components in the, in the blood. And something that is very important to understand, and that also goes related to why we respond sometimes to diet and, and why sometimes we don't, is that the microbiome is actually quite, quite stable in, in our cells, meaning that we are now all adults. And after 40 years of like a life, there are a lot of like a insults, maybe antibiotics when, you, when we were like a young, maybe some, of course, uh, genetic component, maybe some environmental component that we have a microbiome that is not so easy to, to, to shift, to change. So that's something that is important. We, that is what we call trajectories. We, we observe very, very uh, little changes in the microbiome, while we, we observe much more like a, a changes in the, in the metabolites, in the uh, coming from the, from the new ingredients at the end of the, of the trial. This is important because again, related to the first talk, uh, what we observed is that what was important was the microbiome at the beginning. So again, these are the patients that are responder, they respond, and these are the patients that they didn't respond. And you can see how the difference is from the beginning. And this Shannon means like a diversity, means that uh, the patients that they responded had like a more like a diverse uh, microbiome. It was stable, didn't change much in the, during the trial, but from the beginning, it was like a different. Now, again, going together, that is the same slide that Dr. Nayak um, presented before. That means that you, you, are, you are eating the same diet, okay? You are, you are giving the same diet to all our patients, 
but they respond differently because they had different microbiome from the beginning of the, of the trial. Then of course, you can see some changes in some, uh, in some um, uh, uh, microbes. Uh, uh, some, this is a, a, a kind of microbe is called uh, Ackermansia. In our trial, it seemed that it was really very protective. Uh, of course, it would be nice to see if the combination with this particularly probiotic and, and our diet uh, works better. We haven't done that uh, study yet, but you could potentially detect a few uh, uh, microbes that maybe help in uh, our diet to, to, to respond better, and, but still we need more, more research. And then we also observe that uh, the metabolome, meaning all these uh, um, uh, mediators, pro and anti-inflammatory mediators, they changed because of course we changed uh, the diet. So a lot, uh, some ingredients there, are what we call anti-inflammatory mediators, like a, a tryptophan and some of the omega-3 metabolites, they were increased as, as expected in the patients that they are responding. So as a conclusion of the, of my, of the trial was that uh, overall, uh, and, uh, different to the, the probiotics uh, that as Dr. Nayak explained very well, we still don't have super strong evidence because we don't have good, um, good um, trials and because there is no like a good regulation on how these probiotics, they reach to the, to the shelves in the, in the supermarket. So there is still a lot of like a work to do about probiotics. In the diet, there is enough randomized uh, trials, there's enough data to suggest that there is like a diet works, at least to some of our patients. And in addition, there is like a, some biologic uh, rationale. And we, we have now we're in the right direction to understand more and more uh, why. The ITIS diet improves the clinical outcomes and, um, and especially the uh, anti-inflammatory score, the baseline in the, the microbiome in the baseline, very important uh, to uh, understand the, the, the response uh, to this diet. And in the last like, uh, uh, two, two minutes, uh, future directions is we, they all ask now, okay, can we use diet to adjust the gut microbiome to improve uh, RA? If we have this um, uh, microbiome and we really change diet for very long time, is this microbiome going to change? So then we can really get better um, metabolites uh, pool and decrease the um, inflammation. Um, again, uh, there is a lot of unknowns, so we cannot give you like uh, the right answer today. Uh, we will hopefully able to collect more data um, soon. We're in the right direction, but um, the only thing that we can tell is that we still don't know what is the right and the wrong microbiome. There is still a lot of like a data to, to go in that direction. We know that uh, a lot of diseases are related to what we call loss of microbiota, uh, microbiota uh, diversity. Like uh, we need to have like a, like a much like a rich uh, diversity. We need to go back to have like a much more like a different types of uh, microbes. So there is some data suggesting that at least in some patients, when you change the diet, uh, increasing the fiber, increasing the polyphenols, uh, uh, increasing the omega-3, uh, decreasing the fried meats and, the, and, the, and, the, and some of the, the, the red meat, uh, all these things increases the diversity. And that probably goes like a, is good for the, for the patient to, to get like a healthy diet and to be as, as, as healthy as possible. Now, the, the, the downside is that, um, I, I mean, like a, this is like a, um, like a bad luck, there is an like individual response to that. Like, a, as I explained before, the, microbi the microbiome sometimes is very fixed. They have like a, some composition that depends on these demographics, location, genetics, depends on a lot of things, and you can eat the same diet, and some patients are able to shift and able to, to change, are able to, to respond better, and some um, uh, patients will not be able to do that. So uh, yes, a lot of like a, a hopes in that direction, maybe combination of diet and probiotics, maybe, but I still want to emphasize that it's going to be an individual uh, response to any probiotic or any dietary, uh, diet, uh, dietary like intervention in our patients. And with that, I, I simply want to acknowledge because a lot of people in my uh, team was involved in this, uh, in this trial, a lot of like a clinicians very interested in, 
in the in diet and uh, and the funding. This is a, um, a foundation here at UCSD that really, they really are focused on on diet and and, and patients. So really, I'm very like thankful for uh, their support. And you have any questions? We'll be like happy now to to answer them. Should I maybe like stop sharing? Maybe you want to to now. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Nayak and Dr. Guma. I, as a rheumatoid arthritis patient, I greatly appreciate all of this insight. I personally have always been intrigued by probiotics and what what foods will make me more inflamed over the others. So I deeply, deeply appreciate. And I cannot wait to look over these slideshows once again after we're done. Um, before we wrap up, we're going to, I know we promised you guys a Q&A and we're going to take time to answer some of your questions. Um, as a reminder, you can always type any of your questions in the chat function at the bottom of the screen. Um, keep in mind that we have received hundreds of questions before the session, so we'll try our best to answer as many as possible. So with that, we're going to get started with our first question, and that is, I don't know, either, I think this would be a good question for Dr. Guma, both of you can decide who wants to give the best answer here. Um, so the first question is, how do dairy and gluten affect the microbiome? And can those foods be, be inf inflammatory for some? <clears throat> okay, I can, I can start. So uh, a lot of like uh, ingredients, we don't have enough data to know if individually what they are, what they are doing in the microbiome. Uh, especially because again, these uh, changes are going to be very uh, heterogeneous. Okay, what what we know uh, in, in in some of the trials that they do what is called like exclusion uh, uh, foods. You know, like they simply like I start from very basic vegetarian uh, uh, diet. When they introduce back the gluten or the dairy, not all the patients responded badly. You know, like uh, you can maybe like start with some exclusion uh, diet. You exclude all the bad. Like ingredients that uh, literature tells you that maybe are pro-inflammatory, but then uh, some of these patients, when they they include back, they introduce back the gluten and the dairy, they didn't uh, respond at the same extent. Some patients they had a flare, okay, but some patients they were perfectly fine with those um, with those ingredients. Or maybe Dr. Nayak knows that there is a specific uh, uh, study showing shift in in microbiome with these ingredients. Yeah, um, sorry, I just <clears throat> want to um, say I have a little bit of laryngitis, which is why I had to pre-record my talk earlier today. So I really am excited to be here and I'm happy to answer questions. But yeah, um, Dr. Guma, I am also not aware of a study that specifically looks at um, gluten or milk or dairy. Um, but I, I would be surprised if there, that the gluten question hadn't been studied in some way, shape or form. And um, those two food groups are interesting because um, there are people who have either lactose intolerance, um, it, meaning that they can't digest the, the dairy and that will cause gut symptoms like bloating and gas and diarrhea. But that's a different kind of immune, um, it's not actually, I don't think of it as an, an immune response. It's just that your body doesn't have the enzymes needed. So, so dairy is kind of like a different category um, but whereas gluten, you know, some people actually have an immune reaction to gluten, um, and, and those can, that can certainly cause inflammation. And I do think that, um, both of those, so, I mean, I don't know, I'm not aware of the studies that look specifically at dairy or gluten, but we do know that some of the consequences of the, you know, either the immune response to gluten can cause kind of a shift in the microbiome because there's inflammation happening in the gut in response to gluten. Um, and also we know for sure that um, like the, how quickly stool kind of goes through the gut shapes the gut microbiome. So if you're eating a, a lot of dairy and you're not able to digest it, you're gonna get these loose stools and that certainly will change the microbiome. But I don't think anyone's really looked at um, specifically those foods and how they affect immunity in patients with osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis or lupus. 
Um, next question is for Dr. Nayak. Thank you both of you for the, the answering that question so well. Um, our next question is for Dr. Nayak. How can we find clinical trials to participate in? Great question. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think when I see patients in clinic, I'm so focused on them and their symptoms. Um, but, and I don't even think that, <laughs> you know, oh, I should ask them to enroll in the clinical, but if the patient asks me, are, are there trials that I could participate in? I'm like, oh yes, there are so many and here's what you could do. So, um, you know, I would say that if you're in clinic with your patient, with your doctor, or if you send them a message on your, um, you know, your electronic medical record portal, you can find out about the trials that are ongoing at the, uh, at the clinic or the institution where you're receiving your care. And that's like the best way to plug in to a clinical, a clinical trial or a clinical study. Yes, because a lot of patients, they, they contact me about the trial that we are conducting, but if they don't live in South California, it's very difficult to participate because as a participate. So in our trial, we, uh, we have a, a, a dietitian. So they, um, they have like a one-to-one -one, uh, like a discussion with them. So of course, I think that is a very good trial for the patients because they get a lot of like education, but they have to, they have to be in the, in the South California. So I think the best way to know if there is something going on, as Dr. Nayak said, is to ask in the institution. Maybe somebody is doing already like a, some research in that, uh, in the, in, 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 in that, on, on diet, in the institution, or at least in that area. Our next question is for the both of you. Um, what other lifestyle measures besides diet can I take to improve my gut microbiome diversity? Well, exercise, I guess. <laughs> so everything, so like having like a healthy lifestyle is, uh, is already known, meaning that uh, you sleep well, you are not stressed, you do exercise, you eat healthy. I mean, what happens is sometimes it's impossible to do that because our normal life is like a do everything quick. You don't have time to sleep, you are stressed. So, I mean, what is healthy, um, like a lifestyle, all these things, I mean, everything really changes the microbiome and, and shapes the microbiome. And there are a lot of like a, I mean, you can really find anything like a, uh, even like a, I don't know, like a diet Coke, you know, like a, a lot of things that we know that they are like a unhealthy. Uh, there are a lot of literature now um, showing that there is a shift in the microbiome. So again, it's going to be individual responses, okay? But as a general question and general answer, um, exercise, sleep, um, and uh, of course, stress, all these things uh, shape the microbiome and probably are, uh, are unhealthy for the microbiome. Dr. Nayak? I don't think I have much more to add to that. You know, and I think sometimes um, maybe one thing I emphasize is it's better to get rid of things that are harming your microbiome, like the processed foods, like alcohol, like smoking. And sometimes those are some of the biggest changes that you could make to improve you know, your health. But uh, I totally 100% agree with Dr. Guma. And that's also what I tell my patients. Everything that's actually good for your own health is also good for your microbiome. That makes so much sense. And as a patient, I'm always trying to find different ways to reduce the inflammation. So I can definitely go for saying that when I do put more strain on my body, I'm gonna feel worse if I'm not paying attention to my mental health as well. I'm also gonna feel worse. So there's a lot of different factors that go into reducing inflammation and microbiome. Um, and I know a lot, we're getting a lot of questions also about the diet slides and the presentation. Um, once we're done with the webinar, you can go back to arthritis.org slash webinars, and you can click on past webinars and it will take you to the page from there. So you can go back and review the slides. Our next question is for Dr. Guma. How long do you recommend trying the ITIS diet to clearly see results? Does a cheat day reset this completely? Yeah, that's a very good question. So our, like our, uh, and I hope to give you the answer very soon. So our first trial was only, as I told you, between two and four weeks. And one of the questions that, of course, a lot of people, special researchers, they had to me was, okay, that was too short. Maybe if you had like a continue the diet longer. Uh, so that's what we are doing now. So we are doing now a randomized trial uh, between Mediterranean diet, kind of like a, is, I would say like a healthy style, okay, uh, versus ITIS diet. 
and we are like a, 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 a following the patients at least three months. Okay, and what I can I can tell is that we see that the response gets more like a like a stronger. Okay, when we uh, reach this two or three months uh, like a time point. Okay, some patients they still they respond very quick. We still see that. Okay, so and I still cannot have numbers. Can we give you numbers like a everybody responds at some point. No, I don't know that yet. But what I really see is that after one, two, three months, the response is more like a, a more a more clear, a, like a stronger, and we hope uh, stable, stable. But we still don't know that. Okay. Quick question, um, Dr. Guma, how can we, where can we go to follow this um, research that you have going on? Uh, I mean, if you, you want to participate, you can simply send me an email. That's very, okay. uh, but again, it has to be people living in South California because the patients need to come and check the, 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 uh, the outcomes. We collect also blood because we need to understand what's going on. We try to do some biological research as well, but yeah, you can directly uh, email email to me yeah that's great um and we'll share your email at the end of the webinar so everyone can have it um and this question for is for the both of you um what is leaky gut and how is it related to arthritis great question and can you fix it with lifestyle measures do you want to start <laughs> oh yeah so um leaky gut <clears throat> i think really comes from studies in patients who have inflammatory bowel disease, basically your gut, um, the cells are very tightly packed together and they create this beautiful barrier that prevents bacteria from going from the gut into the circulation and into the rest of your body. When that beautiful barrier becomes open or, or leaky and it can be penetrated either by micro microbes or the things that they produce, that leads to an inflammatory response in the gut. Um, and of course, then things that translocate across the gut, if they go to other sites, um, can cause inflammation at, at other sites as well. Um, and so, you know, there, there is this idea that um, leaky gut can be from a number of different things. Um, I usually see it in the form of like the immune system, um, you know, not being able to, to dampen the, the inflammation from microbes, the, the sort of connections between cells are not there um, for one or more reasons. And so then patients end up having, um, get GI symptoms and, and just generally feeling poorly. And, you know, it happens in patients who have inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, but it can happen in patients with autoimmune diseases like psoriatic arthritis or other spondyloarthritis. Um, you know, people have ankylosing spondylitis or reactive arthritis. Um, and so, you know, the question of what to do to, did you say to get rid of it or to make it better? I'm not sure that we have the answer to that. Um, and I think that that is like an active area of investigation. I don't know if Dr. Guma, you have updates um, or clarifications about, you know, the causes and the treatments of leaky gut. But, it, you know, it is one of the the, you know, when we talk about gut brain axis or gut joint axis, one of the things that we wonder about is whether that axis is disrupted because that beautiful barrier that exists between the, the you know, the microbes and the rest of our body, that gut lining is, is perturbed in leaky gut. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I love this, this topic, by the way, the, the, the leaky gut, because, uh, uh, that 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 helps to explain why we have uh, in some of our diseases this this this, like, this gut joint axis, okay? And in RA, specifically in RA, we still don't have like enough evidence, meaning that uh, to 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 have evidence in patients, we need like a biomarkers of leaky gut, okay? Of course, in animal models, there is we still we we're starting having some evidence. In other diseases, it's very obvious. But uh, there is enough, at least like a mild evidence in the right direction, suggesting that uh, some of our patients, both because of the inflammation or because of some really intrinsic part of the RA, uh, has this leaky gut, and that is going to help to make the disease chronic because you have more, more, more inflammatory uh, components, let's say, okay? So we don't know exactly what the microbiome uh, is actually doing when the leaky, when you have like a more or less leaky gut, but we, we, we can assume that you have like a, like a translocate, like, like a, some components of the gut, they go, to, they go to the blood because of the leaky gut, okay? 
things that they are supposed to stay in the gut, now they are in the blood, it makes sense to think that this is going to be maybe pro-inflammatory, okay? So it's not only changing only the gut, it's simply, as, as, as I explained that in that slide, no? Everything that gets absorbed and goes to the blood, we, we have to uh, uh, assume that uh, the leaky gut will uh, increase those things in the blood and could be pro-inflammatory. And then going back to how to improve it, yes, until we don't know a little bit, a little bit more why we have that, we cannot then um, uh, like a re reverse that. But yes, in other diseases, as, as Dr. Nayak mentioned, psoriatic arthritis, other diseases, the link is more obvious, but in RA, they, they, they're still like a, a more like a, a uh, being like a more and more evidence in the literature about um, this concept of leaky gut in RA. This question is for the both of you, um, or I'm sorry, it's first is for Dr. Nayak. We want you to answer this question. Um, do some arthritis medications impact the gut microbiome more than others? If so, should I talk to my doctor about switching medications? Yeah, that's a, a question that's so near and dear to my heart because that's like exactly what my research uh, focuses on. And because it's research, that means that we don't actually know all the answers yet. So, um, you know, I started studying this drug that we use a lot in rheumatology called methotrexate. And I was really curious whether bacteria have enzymes to metabolize methotrexate. But it, what I found is um, they do have enzymes to metabolize methotrexate, but that methotrexate also acts on bacteria. And that was a total surprise because drugs like methotrexate and other drugs that we use in rheumatology were not developed to target the microbiota. They were developed to act on host cells, on, the hu on human cells. But, um, but I found that they do in fact um, act on microbes. And then that brings up the question of, well, what does that mean for the patient? Is that why some patients experience you know, a, a little bit of GI upset on the days that they're taking methotrexate? You know, and is that a good thing or a bad thing? And you know, one of the things that I have found is that, you know, because the microbiota is so tied to the immune system, um, and we actually think that the microbiome may contribute to some inflammation in rheumatoid arthritis and in other inflammatory arthritis, that, um, you know, methotrexate may actually be acting on the microbes to reduce inflammation. So in addition to, you know, acting on immune cells in humans, methotrexate may actually be acting on your microbiome as well to lead to less inflammation in rheumatoid arthritis and possibly other diseases. And so if that's the case, that would be really interesting to know because like we don't actually have therapies directed against the microbiome right now to treat RA. Um, and so, you know, if we understand how methotrexate and other rheuma rheumatologic drugs act on the microbiome to reduce inflammation, that's gonna be really powerful knowledge to develop new therapies or to, you know, develop diets that affect the microbiome in similar ways. Um, and so, you know, the short answer to the question is, yes, probably we, we have evidence for at least one drug methotrexate acting on the gut microbiome. Um, we think that that might be one of the ways that it actually works to reduce inflammation. And I would not actually at this point say that we have enough evidence to suggest that you talk to your doctor about switching therapies because, you know, that might actually be like the thing you don't want to do with methotrexate <laughs> acting on your microbiome to reduce inflammation. But we're still learning about all other kinds of drugs too, like azathioprine and hydroxychloroquine and lacunamide. I think that those are all active areas of investigation um, in my lab and in other labs too. I don't know if you have other things um, to add, Dr. Gumar. No, I, I think that it is, this, this field is, uh, is going to grow a lot thanks to uh, Dr. Nayak's like, uh, research and, and, and it's something that is maybe now makes sense, like uh, why we didn't like, uh, check that, it's obvious, okay? But, uh, but we, didn't know. we didn't know about microbiome. We didn't know the microbiome was so important to everything. So we still need maybe this, maybe, I don't know, five years of like a very intense research and we'll start having uh, these, uh, these answers. And again, it will be again inter-individual, so it will not be an answer for everything, but hopefully we will then at some point have the right biomarkers to then maybe pre predict no, the, what's going, to, what's going to, uh, to, to happen in that particular patient with the combination of that microbiome with that treatment, you know, like a, we, we have to go uh, there as well. Right. Um, as I'm hearing Dr. Nayak mention some of the medications that I've been on or I am on now. So I'm very excited to keep up with both of yours research to see 
how those medications are affecting our gut. Um, it's really useful information to, you know, continue to be healthy and stay on a healthy diet um, to know what's helping us and what isn't. Um, and so our next question is for the both of you. And if you have a gastroenterologist who says to take a pre probiotic and have a separate physician who is a rheumatologist and they do not say to take a probiotic, what should one do? This is a very, very confusing situation to be in. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, I think both of us think very similar because we discussed that in uh, when we met before the, the webinar. Uh, I, I do think that, especially because the probiotics, they are very expensive and sometimes we don't have evidence. I myself proactively don't tell them to take, okay? I try to change diet, but I don't uh, proactively tell them to take. But if they have another physician that suggested that, okay, because maybe they have some GI symptoms, as Dr. Nayak mentioned, no? They have some GI, some uh, stomach uh, symptoms and they can afford it and they really want to try. I always tell them to do a trial of like a three months, you know? Like when we do, when we change therapy, we also tell the patients, be, be, patient, be patient for three months. Let's see if adding Claquenil helps or does not help with the probiotics or probiotics or supplements or whatever they find in the in the shelves on the supermarket. I tell them if you really want to try, that's okay. But try three months. Be honest with yourself, and if you really see an improvement, great. Okay, but I, uh, I proactively I'm not uh, uh, telling them to take them because of the lack of evidence because it's expensive. And, and because I don't want to confuse the patient, okay? But in this particular uh, situation where they have a conflictive, um, like uh, messages, I would tell them, try, but a, a reasonable time, you know? And you don't feel any improvement, just like uh, up to you, basically, no? Hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I would, it's exactly the same thing I would say. I think there are some patients that are really eager, you know, to try different things. And it's, a, you know, it's a, a thing that's what we call here shared decision making, you know, where there isn't enough evidence yet, there's still a lot to learn. So maybe the probiotic will help, but we can't, I can't say I'm gonna, I have a lot of evidence to suggest that it will help, but maybe that the gastroenterologist experience, you know, with his patients or her patients suggests that it might help. So um, I totally 100% agree with Dr. what Dr. Huma said, and, and that's also what I would do. And that's what we were talking about before the session, like the art of medicine. We don't have enough science, um, and so like now it's like, it's the art of it <laughs> that we're practicing. Right, that totally makes yeah. sense. Yeah, and uh, personally, since I'm on so many different medications myself, since I have rheumatoid arthritis, I'm on a biologic medicine, I'm on this medicine, that medicine, it gets so hard to keep up with all of these things. And so personally, what I've started doing is any medication that I've stopped or started, I'm keeping a log of it. What are my side effects? How am I feeling? What is my mood like? So I can consistently stay up to date with how I'm feeling with each medication that I'm on. And that's probably a good resource for other RA or arthritis patients as well to continuously keep that log. So you can have that reminder of what's working for you and what isn't. Um, and so our next question is for Dr. Guma, can intermittent fasting help with gut health? How is itis di diet different than the Mediterranean diet? Well, so the second question is easier to answer than the first one. The second question, uh, if you uh, get the, the, the diet from Arthritis Foundation and you check all the ingredients, Mediterranean diet is actually has some of them, but um, they also have a lot of ingredients that we don't recommend. For instance, Mediterranean diet is, is like a rich uh, uh, in tomatoes, for instance, and rich uh, in potatoes. There is nothing against tomatoes and potatoes, you know what I mean? But that is, is considered anti, um, it's considered pro-inflammatory in, uh, in array. For instance, Mediterranean diet doesn't say anything against eating bread. There is nothing really against bread. There are examples where there is nothing uh, said they are against like a dairy. Uh, Mediterranean diet is a, is a diet that is very, is very full of uh, rich uh, in omega-3. That's true because it's all about olive oil, okay? Out of vegetables, but uh, you can eat red meat, you can eat a lot of like a products that they're healthy if you don't have uh, arthritis. You know what I mean? So the idea is to remove these few components. We didn't really change much 
we only remove a few that we consider pro-inflammatory in a patient that has RA. It doesn't mean that it's unhealthy in the normal population. You know, it's, it's good to eat a little bit of everything, but we decrease, we, we try to decrease the pro-inflammatory foods. And in addition, we add um, like a condiment, like a pepper, um, curcuma, we uh, add seeds, uh, uh, things that the Mediterranean diet, they are not uh, particularly rich of them. I mean, you know, they, I mean, you can take if you like, but you don't really like a, eat that in a regular uh, Mediterranean diet. So uh, overall, it's actually quite different. Like, uh, like, it seems similar because, of course, it's, it's, there is nothing drastic that you change, okay? But they're quite um, different. About the intermittent fasting is really a very good uh, topic. There is no evidence at all in our disease but I have to say that the, what I've seen in uh, other diseases, especially in metabolic syndrome, uh, is actually quite uh, compelling. And I really, I, I really believe on fasting, uh, intermittent fasting for these metabolic uh, diseases because they are nice trials in patients with diabetes, with like um, dyslipidemia, like uh, these different comorbidities, nothing to do with arthritis, that the results are quite, are, are, are quite clear, okay? But we still don't have evidence in arthritis. So as a concept, you could say that maybe that regulates the microbiome, maybe that regulates everything. So a, a very nice uh, field there, we don't have evidence. And the, the only reason that I didn't include that in my diet was because it's very hard to do. I mean, it's really, really very hard to do in the intermittent fasting. Uh, we didn't have evidence and we really wanted to make a feasible diet. So to have as many patients as possible that they could follow the diet. And intermittent fasting, again, is, is really, um, I mean, it's difficult to, 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 to create the habit uh, of that. So that's why I didn't include it. But it's, it's, it's a possibility. And, and, and I, I hope that somebody takes that uh, kind of research in, in patients with arthritis. Yeah. Okay. So this last question is for the both of you. Um, is there a relationship between gut health disorders like Crohn's disease, IBS, and arthritis? What can I do to improve symptoms of Crohn's and IBS? Mm -hmm. You want to start, Tornaya? <laughs> um, <laughs> <brain completely. so, laughs> yeah. Um, so we do think that there is a uh, relationship between what's happening in the gut and what's happening in the joint, because we see it in our clinic that people who have Crohn's disease will also have um, disease outside of the gut, what we call extra intestinal manifestations of their Crohn's or their ulcerative colitis. And then they'll develop inflammation in the spine or in the joints, like the knee and the hands and so on. Um, and so, <clears throat> but it's not 100%, I don't think we know whether that that's mediated by the gut, although I think that there's really compelling evidence in animal models to suggest that there's that relationship. Um, like we don't know if it's microbes or if it's like something inherent to the immune system where something there's something wrong with the immune system and that same abnormality causes people to have gut symptoms and joint symptoms. Um, and so, you know, I guess what we know from patients is that there is this relationship between inflammation in the gut and inflammation in the joints, whether that's from the immune system or from the microbes in the gut in patients, we don't 100% know for sure. And that's, those are really hard studies to do in people. Um, and, but we, we have evidence from mouse models that um, perturbation of the microbiome can lead to um, gut inflammation and joint inflammation. And so you know, that's what's happening in the mice, also what happens in humans, and that provides evidence for that for that relationship. Now, the, you know, what to do about treating Crohn's and IBS, that's like, you know, if you have Crohn's, you should have a gastroenterologist and work with your gastroenterologist to find like, good therapies because there are really good therapies out there, you know, um, drugs um, for, for Crohn's. And I'm not sure about IBS, but I, I believe that there are also therapies out there for IBS. Um, and then, you know, if you on top of those have an arthritis, then you'll be co-managed by a rheumatologist and a gastroenterologist. Um, and, and together, you know, we, where we work, rheumatologist works with the gastroenterologist to find therapies um, that will address symptoms in the gut and the joint. 
that being said, I don't think that either the gastroenterologist or me as rheumatologists would say, you know, here's microbiome based interventions that will address both what's happening in your gut and the joint. We're not there yet um, in terms of therapies that have or interventions that have been studied and can be recommended to patients. Um, and so like everything that you heard in this webinar so far, eat healthy, exercise, make sure you're following the recommendations of your physicians. You know, when there's evidence to support an intervention, try to do those things. Um, those are all the things that I would say um, for people who have a gut joint disease to do those, all of those things. And then, you know, stay on top of the research um, by, you know, tuning into amazing studies by Dr. Guma <laughs> and other people in the field and, you know, these webinars to find out where, where are we now and what do we have available? But yeah, it's a little bit of a vague answer because um, there's so many ways to answer that question. Some, uh, you know, some of the answers with really good evidence and others where we're still at the frontier of, of investigation. So I, I would only like to add that uh, the Chronic Oncolitis Foundation, uh, that is, is, is as good as your arthritis foundation is really very, very uh, patient oriented uh, foundation for the IBD uh, patients. Somebody's like a, in the, in uh, here uh, having IBD or is asking for some uh, fam uh, relative or family. Um, the, the, Crohn, the Crohn and Colitis Foundation, they have a very strong uh, diet program. Okay. They actually uh, um, uh, uh, funded or still funding uh, two or three uh, big uh, programs about diet, microbiome, and um, in, in IBD. And I know that there is at least a couple of like uh, good papers recently in a good review, in a good journals, with a good amount of patients um, discussing a couple of diets that they are supposed to be uh, good. As Dr. Nayak said, if that really correlates and is the, the, the blame is the microbiome or something else, uh, I don't think these uh, trials, they answer that because I think that they were more like a cl clinical uh, trials, not so much like a trying to understand the biological um, uh, explanation, but at least there, there will be some um, uh, instructions, you know, some recommendations, okay, in those trials. And for sure, if they contact the colitis and, and chronic colitis foundation, they will probably like, get some information because they are literally running these, uh, these studies uh, now on diet and IBD. That's great. Um, I have taken away so much from both of you today as a patient. I want you to, to really thank both of you from the bottom of my heart for lending your time and expertise tonight. Um, coming from a point where I've had so much difficulty even locating a rheumatologist near me and now I'm speaking to you today, that means so much to me. And I believe that I can speak on behalf of the audience that we've definitely gained a different perspective on how to manage our arthritis symptoms. So I really deeply wanna thank you from the bottom of my heart. And um, for your email, Dr. Guma, I have it, it's mguma at health.ucsd.edu. Mm -hmm. Again, yeah. that's mguma, if anybody wants to write it down, m-g-u-m-a at health.ucsd.edu. I also want to say I would love for all of you to come visit me on my Instagram page. It's called The Arthritic Life, T-H-E, Arthritic Life. Um, come stop by and say hi. I love seeing new faces. Um, both of you, Dr. Nayak and Dr. Guma, I would love it if you could stop by and say hello to me there as well. Um, and as we come to an end, I also wanted to share some tools and resources uh, with all of you. Yeah. So we have our webinars. Um, we don't have any scheduled for the rest of July, but we have some programming coming up in August, and you can always keep up with those at arthritis.org slash webinars to register and learn more about upcoming events and to review the recordings of past events like this one. We also have our Live Yes podcast and our online community helpline. Um, you can access that through Live Yes um, and connect with groups and online community forums through there and keep in touch um, with your fellow arthritis warriors and stay up to date with the local resources that we have. We also have our um, insights program 
If you haven't already, filling out the insights assessment is a simple way to help the foundation develop more programs that are important to you. And this is very helpful to people like me and you to have that insight from everyone. Um, and taken with that, I wanna thank both of you again. And uh, thank you for Robin for inviting me to be the host tonight. I had a great time. I learned so much and I'm looking forward to reviewing everything that we went over. Thank you.